You guys are going to love our guest this week. Brittany Verlinich is a Facebook group expert, and she is here to share how Facebook groups, using them inside of your business, can help you grow your TPT business or grow your own personal brand. And I cannot wait for you to hear everything that she has to say because she makes it sound so incredibly simple. And it is. The truth is that marketing with your Facebook group does not have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be time consuming. And she's going to share all about that in today's podcast episode. Now, I got to know Brittany through RTA. She is a member of Rebranded Teacher Academy. And that's how I got to know her. And in fact, she has a workshop inside of our RTA library all about how to grow your business with Facebook groups and how to get started with Facebook groups. And when I watched her workshop, I knew like I had to bring her on the podcast. I'm so excited for you guys to hear from her today as well. And without further ado, meet Brittany. Hey, Brittany, how are you? Hey, Lauren, I'm good. How about yourself? Good. I am so glad that you came on to chat today because I, you know, I was looking a while back for people to come in, guest experts to come into RTA and to share about their areas of expertise, whether it's Instagram, Facebook groups, YouTube, podcasting, things like that. And Facebook group experts are really hard to come by. And I lucked out with you because you are a Facebook group expert, but you're also a member of RTA, which is really exciting. And so I'm so excited to chat with you and hear you share all about how Facebook groups have helped you grow your business and how other people can get started with Facebook groups as well. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I love your membership, by the way. It's great. (laughs) Well, thank you. So let's talk about um, your Sir TPT journey. Let's start with that. Talk to us about your TPT store. What's your niche? How long you've been selling on TPT? Just tell us a little bit about your TPT business in general. Sure. So I first started selling back in 2020. I think I was one of those many people who during the pandemic decided to open a store. And I actually have more than one store, which I know makes me probably a crazy person. But when I first started, I wanted to start with what I knew. So I made Google Classroom headers and I made lots of editable Google Docs because that's what I had made for my class. We had talked about like writing and things like that. And I found that was something that people were really craving during the pandemic. And I also had this uh, probably an unusual experience because in my first month I made $400 and I was like, whoa, that's it. I'm quitting my job, you know, which obviously that's not how... That's not usually how it works. And that's it's not been the same since then, which I think is also important to share too, right? Because so many things were different during COVID. But I think what that showed me was the potential and the possibility. And so I said, okay, I'm going to keep going with this. And I think also looking back and finding out what worked, I had a YouTube channel I was building up a little bit that I was playing with. I had a Facebook group of really engaged people in there. And I had built that community before I started the TPT store. So I think I also had the added benefit of asking them what they wanted and needed. And so I had that before I made anything or at least polished the stuff I was making for TPT. So that's what started there. And then that got me into the whole online world anyway. I was already doing a little bit of blogging and I was like, okay, why don't I just marry these things and start doing it? And so that's why I started building the Facebook group strategy, even though that's not really what I was focusing on, but I figured out that was like kind of the crux point to help me build my list and then help me build a community of awesome teachers. And yeah, and that was now, wow, almost three years ago, which is crazy. Wow. I know that's insane that it's been that long since the pandemic. But let's talk about, let's let's hone in. I want to hone in on a little something that you said. You kind of talked about how you realized that this was going to be the crux of your business, like the Facebook groups, like almost like everything was going to flow in and flow out of these Facebook groups. What Was there a defining moment when something happened and you were like, this is where I'm going to put my energy and my effort, and this is why? Like where, where did you, did you see increased revenue? Was it seeing increased subscribers to your email list? Like what specifically was it that you were like, okay, this is it. What was it about the Facebook groups? Yeah, well, I had built the Facebook group before, right? I had a community of teachers who love to travel. And so the TPT thing wasn't really on my radar at first because I didn't consider myself a teachery teacher, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know, there's this, this vision that we all have to be Pinterest perfect and everything has to be super visually appealing and decorative and stuff. And which I found out was that wasn't my strong suit, but I figured out I had other skills that were valuable, right? Anyway, the Facebook group, I think what I really saw about it was it was a place where I could hear back from them directly. As opposed to on Instagram, it felt like you're just like sending a broadcast and maybe people will respond, but it's all really dependent upon you and like the energy that you bring. And you don't always get prompted by the people. You, it's always starting with you kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall. At least that's what I felt at first yeah. years ago. And so I, I wasn't super active on there. It didn't really resonate with me. But there was something about having a community, like a, a community-centered approach that really did resonate with me. 
And so being able to ask people in real time what they thought and getting immediate feedback, seeing what questions they were asking and using that to inform my content and inform future products, or even just seeing like when someone say like, like, oh my gosh, I'm struggling with writing right now. How are you guys doing it? And I would just do some social listening and I didn't know what it was called at the time, but that's what I was doing. I was seeing what people were asking in my group and other people's groups and then creating what I saw, or at least that I, I could create to solve their problems. And I think, yeah, I think that's what it really was. It was like using other people's groups for social listening, paying attention to what people needed, and then having a community first approach, which I think made it easier to sell because then it wasn't like super pitchy all the time. You know what I mean? Because they had already built a relationship with me. I was going live in there once a week at that point. So they already knew me. And I think that made it a lot easier. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about that. With this, you already had the Facebook group beforehand. And I think some people may hear that and they may kind of be like, well, you know, that that's easier because you already had something to start with. But really, most people who have been selling on TPT for a while, they have an audience somewhere that they could maybe even push into that Facebook group and get some of those benefits that you're talking about where they're getting feedback directly from their audience and they're having conversations and it's not them having to be the person who's driving all of the engagement all the time. So pros and cons with that. But what was that transition like from switching from, I'm just somebody here who's like a facilitator of conversations and I'm not trying to sell you anything to then like, oh, just kidding. Now I actually have something to sell you. What was that transition like for you? Yeah, that that's a good question because I do feel like that can kind of affect your that energy and how you show up in a way. Like if you kind of like stutter or hold something back if you have something to sell. But I I don't think I had that because I really was just trying to help however I could. And also I had this all this extra time that I know wasn't the case for everybody at the pandemic, but we were teaching from home. Actually for the first three weeks, my school had no idea what we were doing. So I didn't really wasn't even teaching. I don't know what we were doing, making packets, I guess. And I was like, I have all this free time for the first time in years. You know, so I was even more engaged and active online because I was like, how can I help? Just like, what can I do? And I think that made it more well received. I also want to like do some counter to what you had said about like, well, what if I don't already have a community? Because I can totally understand someone hearing that and say, oh, she just got lucky. And, you know, I want to be honest and say maybe there was an element of luck, but I did want to test that theory. So two years ago in April 2021, I did a completely separate brand and store. That's kind of where Math with Minis came from. And I just wanted to say, I want to do a competitive niche and see like if what I'm doing actually works or was I just lucky because I wanted to see. I didn't want to say this is the answer. This works really well if I had just had luck. So I did replicate it. And like just from like that and doing light stuff on Facebook groups, I was able to get my email list to about 500 people pretty quickly. So and it's fluctuated since then, right? When you sell emails, promotional people unsubscribe and stuff. But I just want to say that like I I did test that out because I totally understand what you're saying about like you could just get lucky if that's what you're thinking. But I also want to challenge that and say everybody has different strengths. You're never really starting from zero. You always have strengths and skills that you're bringing from the classroom. You have your coworkers that you could use as like, hey, come join this community with me. I want you guys to help me inform inform future products. So none of us are really starting from scratch. We all have different skills and stuff that we're bringing to the table. Absolutely. And and one of the things that I found about Facebook groups is that people search for Facebook groups. So you could even start with something that's super niched. You know, you could start with sixth grade math teachers in your state. And there you'll find that some people, they just find it organically. They start searching for groups. They're looking for information and they'll find you. And you don't necessarily have to have, you know, you don't have to have feelers out there. You don't have to have, you know, social media or email or YouTube or podcasting or anything like that to drive traffic, although it is very helpful. So, but let's talk about the first Facebook group, the very first Facebook group that you built. How did those people find you? Because did they find you organically through Facebook search or did they find you from your blog? Where were they coming from? So a little bit of both. So my first one, and I mean, my first one wasn't related to business, right? It was more of a shared hobby or interest. It was teachers who love to travel. And so I had told people that I knew online that teachers were who are into that. I said, hey, come join me. I'm making a group for us. So when we go on trips and stuff, we can travel together, which it was what it was, right? That's what it, literally what it was. And when they liked that, they started inviting other people. So that helped. And then I did also have a blog. So that drew some traffic too. And I used that actually before I knew about like opt-ins and lead magnets and stuff because I didn't know what any of that was. The Facebook group kind of was the lead magnet because I was collecting email addresses when they were joining. And it was like the community is what they were searching for. That's really what they wanted. They weren't really looking for a product at the time, right? Or necessarily a tour because they could always book that on like Expedia if they wanted that. 
it was they wanted the connection. And I think that's a big part of Facebook groups is that people want to connect with other people. I mean, like you can just like think while you're listening, like when you go onto Facebook, how do you spend your time on there? You might scroll a little bit, but I would almost like bet with real money that you probably go to a few different groups when you log on to Facebook. That's my group. Yeah. Like, that's my guess is that you have like three or four go-to groups that you go to on there for different things. Maybe one for cooking, one for TPT, one for like your actual niche specific stuff, maybe one for like your grade level teaching. But that's how that's how teachers that we're providing services for are too. Like they're looking for certain things and answers. And so figuring out like where they're going, what they need, what they're searching for, and then providing that for them is really the basics of it, but then also the connection and community piece so that you don't have to be engaged all the time, that you can step back and then they engage with each other is like the goal and it'll eventually get there. Yes. Okay. So that was the part that I was actually, you said what I was about to ask you next. And that is, you know, you're talking about having engaging conversations and making all of these connections. And that to me sounds like a lot of work. And, and I'm definitely, you know, I'm in as hands off as I can possibly be, that's how I want to be with my business. Like that's kind of my goal moving forward. And so let's talk about how you can kind of start to prompt some of those organic conversations because, and I'm curious if you're going to say one of the things that I, that I have in my head that's actually helped one of my Facebook groups because it's not something that you would normally expect, but like, how do you cultivate? How do you cultivate and create a community where those conversations come naturally from the members of the community? And it's not something that you are constantly having not a conversation that you're constantly having to start. Yeah. And I will say, I want to be totally transparent and say that it is work at the beginning, just like with anything, right? When you're trying to figure something out, it's always going to be a little bit more work and effort and time at the beginning. Like, I don't, I don't want to front that for sure. And I think that there, of course, like, you know, I provide services. So there is a degree of outsourcing that you can do. But I really think at the beginning, it's the best use of your time to figure out how it works and what the strategy is. That way you could even know what you're outsourcing. That's just kind of like a rule for outsourcing in general. But with groups, especially because you're you're really starting the conversation yourself because it's your passion that's going to come through your excitement, even if you're not a super dynamic thing. I've heard that from teachers before, like, oh, I'm introverted. I'm not super outgoing. You don't have to be live every week if you don't want to be. Uh, it's it's You're going to attract the people who resonate with you anyway. So I do think you should start the conversations. I will say one thing that really helped me is bash scheduling content. That has helped me out a lot. And I think like energy wise, like spending an hour or two every month is way easier on your brain than trying to figure out every day what you're going to post and what kind of conversations you want to start. So that really helps out a lot too. And if you do have a blog or a podcast or a YouTube channel, you can use that to guide the content. Like you can use that for future content ideas. And you can use that for the discussions. Like I can think of a few different groups who do this really masterfully where they'll ask a question at the beginning of the week, like a poll, kind of see what they're doing. And then they'll share a blog post like two days later that's related to that. And it's like, I see what mm. you're doing. And that's really good. Yeah. And even just, it could be old content. It doesn't have to be new content either. It could be that you already have, you know, 20 blog posts. You've been doing this for a while. You can just keep repurposing that and get more traffic to those posts. So there's so much you can do there. It doesn't have to be, you in there every day engaging for an hour, I think that wouldn't be a good use of your time. But I will say at the beginning, it's a little more time, just like it is with anything else, because you're figuring it out. It is. Because when there are just a few people in there, like say you only have 20, 30, 50 people in the group, only a very small fraction of your group is actually going to be, they're, 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 they're actually going to be the people who are posting and responding and liking and commenting and all of that stuff. And so if you only have 20 or 30 people, you may have one or two people who are engaged every now and then. And so it is really hard and you may feel like you're talking to a brick wall, but it does take off eventually. But that's when it's really great to have what you were talking about earlier with having your coworkers in there, which may feel a little awkward, but your coworkers are truly like some of your biggest supporters. Like they want to see you be successful and they want to have those conversations with you. And so if you have or even friends or family members that you're like, hey, go in and go comment on this post, even if it's just a gift. Or even if it's just engaging with it in some small way so that my audience can see that people are engaging and it'll help boost, you know, all that stuff. It really does help over time. One of the things that I have been, that's been transformational for my Facebook group, and I'm curious if this has been for yours too, is the at everyone. Has oh, that have, been a big game that, but I want to, I want to hear, I want to hear how it's gone for you first yeah. and then I'll share, but okay. <laughs> Let me tell you because my free Facebook group has, I can't remember how many people. I think it's we're getting close to 3,000 people in the free Facebook group for TPT sellers. I do not have a Facebook group for my math audience, for my TPT audience. I just have it for TPT sellers. And 
prior to this at everyone thing, I'm telling you, I could put it up, I could announce it, I could make an announcement, like no one is seeing this, right? If they're seeing that it's not the people that I want, it's not the people who want to be having conversations about TPT. But as soon and they are and my postings were like, my organic posts from my audience were maybe happening just a couple of times a week. Since I've started using the at everyone, like maybe once every 10 days, I'll use it to extend a conversation from whatever the podcast was about and it opened that conversation up inside of the group. Since I've been doing that, not only have those, not only have those posts received so much more engagement, but the posting, like group members posting within the group and seeing each other's posts and engaging with each other has gone up so much. Like we probably get, you know, one or two posts a day, whereas before, like I said, it was a couple of posts a week. So I've really seen a lot of good results from that. And I'm curious what your feelings are on that, because I know there are mixed feelings on that. People don't want to feel spammed. My thought process on that was that there are a lot of people in the group who are not using the group and they may not even be interested in, in having a TPT store anymore. And so when they joined the group, maybe it was something they were interested in, but it's no longer a group for them. And they need to leave because it's hurting group engagement. And so it kind of helps the prune people out naturally. But the people who want to be there and who want to learn and who want to grow and they want to hear ideas from other sellers and they want to hear what's going on, then they'll appreciate being able to see and be a part of those conversations. And if they don't, then it's okay because they can go. And I don't mean that harshly. I truly don't. But like, I want, that's how I want my group to be. I want it to be a place where they can have conversations. And so it's been transformational for me, but I want to hear your thoughts on it. We'll do some balance because I know there are people who are listening here like, Lauren, I hate when you use that at everyone symbol. Like, <laughs> Okay, so I have the exact same feelings that you had. In fact, I even had, a, I actually made a post in my own group about groups about this because I tried it in my teacher group because I'm always testing things. And that's just part of everything, right? Social media, email marketing. I'm constantly doing A-B testing in different people's groups and seeing like what works. And sometimes different audiences want different things. Like I have noticed if I do that for somebody who has a Facebook group tied to a paid membership, it usually goes over really well because they're like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I missed this. I didn't see it. And that makes sense because you're paying for it. In free groups, it's kind of a 50-50 split. We have to remember too that people use groups differently than we do, right? Like they're not paying attention to like how Facebook works. They don't understand. So when you do that at everyone, they might not realize that you're doing that. They think they're they're being tagged. And so they go back and they're like, I don't see where this person hacked me. So So they're still figuring out that is there. So I have had both. I will say I think it's effective. And I think that it's good for people to leave if they don't want to be there, right? It's good for people to leave. But also remember, you might, if you haven't used it yet, the first time you use it, you might get some people saying, why are you doing this? So yeah. I've had like some clients. Yeah. So I've had some clients say like, please don't use that in my group. My members don't like it. And so I respect that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I say, if you're willing to try it, just test it out and see if it works for you and your group. And I will also say, tagging individual members. Now, this is something you can do when you're first starting out. This is actually a benefit to you if you have a small audience. If you can find tailored content per individuals, oh my gosh, you will make super fans. When I was first starting out that teacher group and there was like 20 of us, I was like, all right, guys, it's just us. What do you guys want to talk about? You know, and I had some teachers who were asking about like teaching abroad and I didn't have that experience personally. But I would go like find an article or someone I did know and say, oh my gosh, like, you know, Sydney, I saw this and thought of you, you would love this. And doing that little like five minutes to do that when you have such a small audience is something that is so, so impactful for them. So that's a way you can build those super fans really quickly. If you're just starting out and you're not sure what to do, I will say if you do have a big group or if you've made a pivot, like maybe you were like a math person before and now you're switching to ELA, that everyone tag would be a really good chance to let everybody know like, hey, are you in or you're out? And, and depending on your brand voice too, you could even say something like that. Like, hey, I'm making a pivot. I don't want you to be in here. I don't want to waste your time. I know your time's super valuable. So this is what we're doing. If, if you're not part of this anymore, it's all good. Here's the leave button. That's one thing you can do. Another thing, if you want to increase engagement, I actually friend request a lot of people who join my groups, which I know not everybody wants to do that. Everybody uses Facebook differently, but I see Facebook as a marketing tool. So I will friend request them. And also, depending on the group, not for every group, but I will also send a message saying, hey, I'm so pumped that you joined my traveling teachers group. So glad that you're here. I, will, I just want to hear from you. Like, are you teaching abroad? Are you looking for like group of people to travel with? I'd love to know what made you join the group. So that's a little bit of market research, but also like a personal touch because I'm welcoming them in. Welcoming them in. 
I will say once you start scaling to like thousands of people in your group, it gets harder to do those things. But those are absolute gifts when you have like under a couple hundred people. So just those are just some other little engagement tips. If you're like not sure how you feel about the add everyone sign or if you want some other things to try in conjunction with it. Yeah. And I love that because that ties in perfectly with what you were talking about earlier with in the beginning, people invite their friends. Like they come in, if they enjoy what they're seeing, they invite their other teacher friends that they know would be interested. And so if even if you're only doing that for, you know, the first 100 people or the first 200 people or the first 500 people who join your group, then that's going to help you grow a lot faster because that personalization, that personal connection that they're going to have with you, not only is that going to build like no like and trust factor for selling to them later on, but it's also going to mean that they're probably going to be more likely to pay attention to what you're posting and share it with your friend, with their friends, which is really important for you. So I love all of this. Let's talk about if somebody wants to start a Facebook group. One of the things that they should probably know, and I should have mentioned this earlier, is the difference between a group and a page. Can you talk about the difference between having a Facebook group and a Facebook page for your business? Yeah, for sure. I see a page as like a landing page. Like if you think about like a page on a website, that's what I really see a Facebook page as. I think it builds legitimacy to your business when you have one, just because if you think of how a lot of people search, I mean, people are searching not only on Google, people search Facebook for businesses. They look for hours, they look for like, you know, reviews and things like that. So I think if nothing else, definitely start a page. It doesn't take too long. There's a little tutorial that walks you through it. And you don't have to have a ton of information on there. But even if you're just driving traffic to your website or to your podcast or YouTube channel or whatever you have going on, I think it'd be really good for you to have a page if nothing else, even if you're not going to do like super marketing with groups. You can also, some groups don't allow this, but you can also join groups as pages. So if you want that separation between your personal life and your business life, it's really good to have a page. That way they're not seeing photos of your kids or your family if you don't want for them to see that. I mix it all because that's just who I am, but I understand not everybody wants to do that. So I want to make sure you know you have that option too. Yeah. And then the group is really more of a forum and community. You can have them linked to pages. So you might even have been in a group and it'll say something like group by or group for, and it'll say that in the cover image, that by is usually the page that's associated with the group. So a group is like a forum is the easiest way I can explain it. But I honestly think of it more like a free membership. So if you could think of how you nurture people in your email, Facebook group is basically the same thing. The only thing I think is different is you get a quicker and easier response back and you get it in real time and you can actually like see the people like I'll even like see like the conversations that they're having, even if they're not talking directly to me, because I think that information is gold for like your sales pages, for like your product descriptions and all that stuff too. And you just don't get that with a page. You don't get as much engagement on pages as you do with a group. Right. Awesome. So I want to make sure that I understood this because this is something that I don't even know if you can do. Can you start a group from your page? Like yes. from your, like Basically. say you have a business page. Okay. So if you really want that separation, because like if you, I do have people who join my group and then request to be my friend on Facebook. And most of the time I'm fine with that. Like I don't post anything personal on my Facebook. And, you know, so as long as I know who the person is, especially if they're like a member of RTA or something like that, I'm usually fine with it. But I can see where you might really want those two things to be separate. And you don't want to have to put yourself in a position where you're having to be like, nope, decline that friend request. And so if you can start it from a page, then that would be amazing. Yeah, I do recommend also making yourself your personal profile an admin though, just because if you ever want to do like ad manager and stuff like it, it just makes it easier to have that extra access. Or if like Facebook disables your page, you want to make sure you can still get into your group. I at least that's what I usually recommend to people. Another thing too, another reason you might want to make a page is even if not right now, if down the road, if you want to use ads, when you interact with people in your group as a Facebook business page, you're actually training the Facebook pixel to, you know, like what kind of people are engaging with your content. And that way, when you make like lookalike audiences, I know that's, that's more advanced, but I'm saying in the future, it's really, really yeah. good idea to interact a little, at least a little bit as your page in other people's groups and also in your group if possible. Not all groups allow pages to join because they don't obviously want other people to do market research in their groups, understandably, but some do. So that's just something to keep in mind too. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so I love that. So what would be a first step? If somebody wants to start a Facebook group, let's talk about, I guess number one, before we talk about first step, let's talk about this. What's the time commitment? Because you mentioned sitting down and batching, which I want to say that you don't have to do that. Like if you want to be a pro at, and you and you really want your Facebook group to be 
a driving force for your business, then yeah, you should probably be doing batching. But I mean, I post maybe every seven to 10 days inside of my Facebook group. So you may, you may not have to do that if you don't want to. But what does a time commitment look like if you're wanting this to be, let's say, serious, like you're wanting to take this seriously? What kind of time commitment should a person expect when having a Facebook group? Yeah, it's hard to give you exact numbers because I don't know where each of you are at. Like if you have absolutely no audience, what I would actually recommend for you to do is use other people's groups first. Like I would say go partner with three to five people who already have Facebook groups. See if you can either like go live in their group, add value to their audience and, you know, drive that traffic to your email list and, and Facebook group. Another thing I recommend is if you do have an email list you're building, you could put your group on the thank you page or make a redirect so they come and join your group too. That way you're nurturing them in both places. So that's what I would do if you're, if you're brand, brand new and if you're not sure you even have the time commitment for your own group. If you do want to start your own group, I would say like give it at least a couple hours a week, you know, like just honestly, because it's going to take you a while to like figure out the tech piece and also to figure out like what is resonating with your audience, figuring out the analytics. On the left-hand side, when you go down to settings, you can see tabs for engagement. You can see the members tab and see who's most engaged. You can see the statistics. There's so much good information in there. And even if for, for no other reason than that, I think that would be reason enough to have one because you can't always get that good of statistics from an email service provider or from Instagram gives you some insights. But I think you get so much from a group. And also, it's a little more for someone to opt into a group than to follow you on Instagram. I follow a ton of people on Instagram that I don't even remember who I followed. Like I'd have to really go through it and look. But with a group, I'm a little more choosy in who I join, especially if they ask for my email. So those people are usually a, like a step above committed to what you have going on. So I would say a couple hours at first. And then once you know what you're doing, like in there, I would say start timing how long it takes you to do certain tasks. So that way in the future, if you do want to automate or batch or even outsource it, then you know what is going to make the most sense to outsource. Like maybe you want to have a more hands-off business and you want to outsource the engagement. Someone could do a login as your page and they can interact on your behalf if you want for them to, or you could hire someone just with their personal profile, they can engage. So I would look at that. I personally engage in my groups about 10 to 20 minutes a day. When I was starting, that was a lot more, you know, because it was the only thing I was doing. So I was in there for an hour a day, but I know that's a lot. And please don't feel like you have to go and do that. I don't think there's any cookie cutter approach or strategy. that's going to work for everyone. You have to decide what's going to work for you. And also depending on like what you want to drive traffic to, it's going to be different. Like if you have a blog post, then maybe you do want to schedule them out because you want to have the links in there. And then if you're like focusing on your TPT store, like you want them to come follow your store, maybe you schedule that post every week, asking them to come follow your store. So that way they get your note to followers too. So I think it figure out, you have to figure out what your goals are, where you want to drive traffic to and, and how much time you have to commit. Start with that and then think, what can I do reasonably in this time? It's going to keep it fun and not burn me out. So that was a long yeah. way of saying it depends. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, I totally agree because I think it does it does depend on your business goal. Like if if I thought Facebook was going to be if if it was working for me and I'm not saying that it's not working. It's doing its job, but if I was wanting that to be the main place where I'm driving traffic to my sales pages, if I was wanting that to be the main place where I'm if I was even wanting and I know this is about to sound really terrible, but if I was even wanting to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and building strong relationships with them within the Facebook group, then that goal may be different. Whereas I would rather somebody send me a private message and be like, hey, Lauren, can you answer this quick question for me? Or, you know, go to my YouTube channel or listen to the podcast or those were kind of the places where we're having the conversations. And then I may spend a lot more time in there. And so I, I totally hear you on that. It just really has to depend on what your goals are. But the beautiful thing about that is that that means that you get to decide, which is really yeah. nice. You get to Absolutely. decide how much time you want to commit to that. And so if you don't have two hours a week or you don't have 20 minutes every day, because I know that time is like the biggest thing that most people who are listening to this podcast, it's like the biggest thing they're short on. And so it doesn't have to be a very lengthy commitment. You could say, I'm going to post once a week and have an engaging conversation. And that could stem from something that you're already sending out to your email list or it could revolve around something that you're doing in your own class. And then as you have time, go in and maybe answer questions that haven't been answered. You know, maybe if somebody asked a question and no one answered it, maybe go in and do that. And then otherwise, just let them engage organically. I also want to add to that saying, like, I don't want anyone to feel bad. Like, if you don't want a community, not everybody wants one. And 
And the reason I'm a big fan of it is because I do think it that having an engaged community is more effective, especially with the age of marketing we're going into. We're in this time of ultimate customer sophistication. We all know we're being sold to. We all know about all the pitching and stuff that's going on, you know? So I do think that having an engaged community of super fans is the best way that I have found to market everything. Like in different niches and industries, I've tried different things out. An engaged community I find is best, but you get to decide what that looks like. I don't want anyone to ever feel like that any one marketing pill is the right thing for everyone. I don't, I don't like how I don't like how it's become that thing. Like for some people, you're just going to have TPT and an email list and that's it. And that's totally cool. Some people are going to have a blog and Pinterest and people are going to have podcasts and a Facebook group. By the way, if you do have a podcast, Facebook group goes really well with that it, so that I would push it a little harder if you're going to consider that because you can continue the conversation in the Facebook group. But I also have had people say like, I don't really know if I want that. And I would tell them it's okay if you don't. I don't think that and there's any right one way to market as long as you're thinking about what is your overall funnel and where do you want people to take them there? You could do a whole funnel on TPT product listing without even going off of there. Yep. So I'm, I don't, I'm not here to convince anybody to start a group, but I do think if you want a community, a Facebook group is the best free tool out there for right now. And you know what? Follow me. I might tell you in six months, if, if I find a better tool, I'll let you guys know what it is. But as of right now, Facebook groups are where it's at. Yeah. And it's been around for a long time. So it's not like Clubhouse, which popped up and kind of dwindled or Twitter was really big for a while. Is Twitter still big? I, I mean, I know people are going to say yes, but in education, is Twitter still a big thing? I think it is in the academic world. And I, okay. I, like my husband is is really like on Twitter all the time. And I'm always so is mine. interested when I see, yeah. And I'm always interested to see like what he finds on there. I'm like, yeah, she's some pretty interesting content. Also, Elon Musk is like heading up Twitter now. So Right. Just like, so I'm I'm curious to see what'll happen with Twitter in the next few months. But I'm, I guess I've never really been on there because I've never considered myself a super academic seller. But if you are, if that is you, like if you have several master's degrees or a doctorate degree and you're like, I really want to like change the way we look at reading or something like that, like that's your goal with your story and your brand, then maybe you should be on Twitter. And, you know, you could use Twitter to to drive traffic to that too. But I don't know a lot about Twitter, so I can't really answer. No, I don't, I don't either. I just don't have fun on there a lot. And of course, you yeah. know, the whole Elon Musk thing, you know, that's been a really big deal. And I'm also curious. That's literally the only thing that I'm curious about is to see what all is going to transpire within the next several weeks. That has nothing to do with the with the Facebook groups, but things like Twitter or maybe TikTok, you know, all those things that TikTok has been around for a while. But I don't see a lot of established TPT sellers saying TikTok is where it's at. And I do know that there are some people who are seeing a lot of success with that. But my whole thing here is that Facebook groups have been around for a long time. People have been using them for a really long time to help them grow their business. And I don't think that this is going to be something that you're going to start today. And then two years from now, you're going to be like, wow, that was a total waste of time because nobody's in Facebook groups anymore. Like they've kind of stood the test of time and they've kind of proven themselves. Much in the same way that like online forums, you know, were a really big thing. It's still the same feel of people coming in, starting conversations and talking back and forth with each other, having that sense of community. So let's talk about just briefly, what are a few things that you would post? Let's say that you're starting a Facebook group page or group, excuse me, you're starting a Facebook group, you're starting it from scratch. What are some things that you can post to start off with that so that no one's sitting there thinking, okay, yeah, but what do I do with this now? You know, like, what do I do with this now? What are a couple of great things that you can just start posting right away? Yeah, so I would have like your opt-in in there, your freebie, your lead magnet, whatever you have to drive traffic to your email list. Like, I think that's really important because you want to have different touch points, right? So like when I'm setting up my groups, I always have a link to a freebie in the cover photo. If you click on edit, Sorry, I'm, I'm moving. I guess you can't see because I'm not, it's a podcast, but I'm like miming it. But if you have like a cover photo, you can click edit there and you can put a freebie opt-in link. So that would be one part where you could get that. You can ask them for their email when they join, but not everybody will want to give you their email address at first. If they just discovered you, they might not feel comfortable with you yet. I still let those people join my groups because I don't want them to be put off by that if they just discovered me and, and you know, I want them to know that they're safe in there. So I will have a welcome post. I tag them on that. And that has my freebie opt-in in there as well. And I do recommend, I know not everybody's going to like this, but I recommend having a welcome video, even if it's two minutes. I know that a lot of people don't like putting their face on video, but if you can, it doesn't have to be anything, you know, super edited. It could just be a Facebook Live that you that you just tag people on. 
but just saying, hey, welcome to the group. My name is Brittany. This is a little bit about my store. And this is who I, I sell third grade teachers with math. I'm so glad you're here. This is my philosophy on teaching. If you agree with that, then you probably love this group. I'm so glad that you're here. Tell me, what grade do you teach? Where do you teach? Super, super simple to start the conversation. And you can just tag people on that welcome post. So I recommend having that. And you could repurpose that every single week if you want. I recommend using the colored background posts for now as of when I'm saying this. So you could ask a simple question like, you know, where do you teach? What do you teach? Keep it super easy. I mean, we all know that we're shot for time. We're usually on social media to like relax or turn our brains off. So keep it easy to respond to it first. And you can ask those bigger questions like if you want, like saying like, okay, what are you struggling most with in math right now? Or like, what, or even just asking, what are you teaching right now? That could be valuable information for you as a seller. Like, should you release this product line this month or in two months from now, right? If they're talking about place value right now, it's like, oh, I better get that resource up there instead of waiting two months. So that's something you could think about. You could ask polls. So you can have like different options in there. One I recently asked was, where do you listen to podcasts? Because I wanted to see which platform were they listening on. And so I discovered, oh, a lot of you are listening on Spotify. Okay, that's good information for me to have. I also asked recently, where are you guys spending your time? So are they spending time on Instagram or TikTok? That could be good information for you as well. So polls, colored background posts, even a photo with a story. I know that it's, it's we're kind of getting away from photos, but there's still some of the most engaging posts out there. If you have something that's heartfelt and you have a photo of your classroom, it doesn't even have to be a photo of you. And maybe it's the way that you have your reading nook set up and you have a story about a student who they were really struggling to like not fidget at their desk. And so you let them go sit by the reading nook and they were able to focus. And that's a really good way to position your resources, but it's also a way to build connection. So anything you can do to kind of share yourself your classroom or your teaching philosophy, even if you're not in the classroom anymore, anything you can do like that is going to be super helpful. And in that way, it's similar to all other social media platforms. Uh, the, the word it's different, I guess, is how you interact with the content and how they interact with it. Because the more you share and put yourself out there, the more your members will do that too. And that's when you'll really start to hit that, like that, I can't think of the term, but like that, that mass gravity effect where it's like now everybody else is doing it and you can kind of step back. So I would say, think about where do you want your group? What do you want your group to be? Do you want it to feel supportive where people can be vulnerable? Do you want it to be a place where people can ask really academic questions and get well-researched answers with links to articles? If, if you think about what you want to position yourself, it's a little bit of a branding question, but also what people want from the group. I think that will help you direct what kind of content you share. And of course, like share your links, right? Share your blog posts, share your podcast episodes, share your YouTube videos, share your products. Don't be afraid to put your products in there. And what I would also recommend is putting a UTM link in there too and seeing what kind of posts did I make with this UTM link to see like what they resonated with. So do a little bit of evidence and, and tracking in there too. I love that. Okay. So if someone's listening right now and they want to learn more about how to build their Facebook group and grow their Facebook group, where can they find you? Yeah, so I have my own Facebook group about groups. It's super meta, meta pun intended, facebookgroup.com forward slash groups forward slash audience and authority. I will also give that link to Lauren so she has that. And then I also have a podcast called Social Media Magic. That's more of overall social media strategy for you. But it also has a lot in there about Facebook groups and growing your email list and using Facebook groups, even if you don't have one yet, and even if you don't want to start your own, there's other ways that you can use them too without having your own group. So I just want you to, to feel rest assured you can still use them to your advantage, even if you don't have 20 minutes a day to do that. Absolutely. Okay. I love that. So let's do a couple of fun questions real quick before we wrap up. Talk to me about what is your favorite podcast, favorite podcast that you're listening to right now? Oh my gosh, that's such a hard question. I listen to like 20 podcasts. No joke. I love Amy Porterfield on my marketing made easy. I feel like it's such a typical answer. But one other one that's really, oh, you like her too? I love her. Um, one, one other one I really like right now is Kate Doster in Box Besties. I will say, yeah, it's really good for email marketing. But one thing she does that's really clever is she actually tells you what to send your list every month. So she just did one for like what to send your list in November. So literally gives you like headline ideas, topic ideas, really, really good stuff. She's a copywriter. So that's one I'm really listening to right now. And, and yeah, I, I have a whole list of podcasts. So I don't want to take up much time on it. I love that. That's absolutely, that's wonderful. And I haven't heard of Kate, so I'll have to look her up. And so what are you binge watching right now? What are you watching on Netflix? Oh my gosh. You know, I actually canceled Netflix. That makes me really boring, but I canceled it because I wanted to have like more focused time. 
which I know is a, a not very fun answer. <laughs> Sorry. But I do want to bring it back when Dairy Girls and Crown are both released. I'm waiting for them mm-hmm. and I'll have it like active for a month. I'll binge those and then I'll go back to, to working harder again. <laughs> I love that. That's perfect. And you know what? That's actually really smart to give yourself seasons where you have those things available to you and like, okay, I'm going to, this is my time to like rest, relax, rejuvenate. And then maybe you cancel those things, save your money and say, okay, now this is my time to focus a little bit. I love that. What, what is your favorite self-care? What's your favorite form of self-care? Travel. I, I, travel. I love of travel. Course. And it just, it, yeah, it's not even just a hobby. It's like when I was in the classroom was what I would look forward to to like get me through those really hard days. I'm like five days till my trip. And now it's like a motivator for me to work hard, right? Like, okay, I'm going to make this X amount of dollars so I can take this trip. And also, I think it's like some of the best self-development and education you can have for yourself. So huge fan of travel. Awesome. So if somebody came to you, me, myself, for example, who's never been out of the country (laughs) and said, where should I go, Brittany? Where should I go for the first trip out of the country? Where should I go? I would say, how adventurous are you? If you're scared about the language barrier, go to Ireland. I think it's a magical destination for first timers. If you're willing to like be adventurous and not know how to read the signs, go to Japan. I have not been to Japan yet, but I'm waiting. They just barely opened back up. So I'm waiting until it gets a little calmer over there. And then I'm going to be heading over there too. Oh, how fun. My brother-in-law actually grew up in Japan. His family, they were missionaries there. And so he lived in Japan. And it was, it's really neat to hear stories about how, how different everything was. You know, it was very safe and they could roam around the neighborhood and just, you know, come and go as they please, which was really cool. So I would love to go there one day. Well, thanks so much, Brittany, for coming on and talking. And I've dropped all of the links to Brittany and her social media and also the website that she mentioned earlier where you can go to learn more and a link to her podcast as well so that you can go check that out. Thanks so much for coming on here and for sharing with us all of your knowledge about Facebook groups. I really, really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks so much for having me, Lauren. If you want to connect with Brittany and grab her ultimate list of Facebook groups for TPT sellers or grab her free Facebook group growth guide, you can do that through the links down inside of the description. You can also connect with her on Instagram and through her Facebook group. You'll also find Brittany at Teacher Sellers Summit this summer. Myself and Brooklyn McCarley, we are hosting a one of a kind conference this summer, July 6th through 9th. It's going to be virtual for teacher sellers, all about building your business, not only on Teachers Pay Teachers, but also growing in other areas from selling on your own website and bringing in tax experts to talk to you about how to do just that to launching your own membership course or just becoming more successful on TPT. The Teacher Seller Summit is a conference that I am really thrilled and excited about. And Brittany is going to be one of our speakers who's going to be talking about how to passively build your email list, through social media marketing that is like not actively marketing on social media, but like passively marketing on social media. And I'm so excited for that session. Tickets do not go on sale for Teacher Seller Summit for a little while, but if you're interested in being on the wait list so that you can find out when those tickets go on sale, then you can sign up for that in the link down in the description as well. By way of update, TPT did release their updated guidelines for search engine optimization and best practices with search this past week. And you could find all of the details on that in TPT University. And I'll be going over that in detail this coming week on the podcast. So be looking forward to that. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like it and subscribe. I put out weekly content for teacher entrepreneurs, helping you grow your business in a way that's purposeful and sustainable. And I will see you in the next video.